Greetings, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us from wherever you hail from. My name is Tim Carey, and I'm a law and policy advisor for the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions. And I have the privilege for moderating a discussion today about a model policy guide that we created to help other states either create or strengthen extreme risk protection order laws. We thank you for joining us during this discussion of a critical resource during a critical port in time. We're living in a country where gun violence is the leading cause of death for youth ages one through 19, where one person is dying from firearms in the United States every 11 minutes as of data from 2022, the majority of which are suicides. But we also know that this doesn't have to be this way. If something can be predicted and the means to address it exist, then it can be prevented. And that's really what we're gonna focus our conversation on today. A resource that's to help states and advocates create some of these preventative policies to meaningfully address gun violence as we see it today. And I'm fortunate to be joined with a remarkable panel of perspectives to help round out our conversation today. I'll start a little bit about myself. My name is Tim Carey, as I've mentioned, I'm the Law and Policy Advisor at the Center for Johns Hopkins I am the Law and Policy Advisor at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions. I draft, analyze, advocate for, and defend equitable gun violence prevention legislation on the federal and state levels. And I'm also the lead author of the resource we'll be discussing today. And I'm fortunate to be joined by Delegate Rip Sullivan, who is from the House of Delegates in Virginia and a member of the 6th District of the Virginia General Assembly. He represents McLean, Great Falls, and parts of Vienna portions of Fairfax County, Virginia. And since becoming a member of the House of Delegates in 2014, he has fought every day to address the gun violence epidemic that we've seen in the Commonwealth. And most notably, he has carried and passed Virginia's Extreme Risk Protection Order Law, known as a Substantial Risk Order, in 2020. We'll also be joined with Representative Jennifer O'Mara who was elected to represent the 165th Legislative District in Pennsylvania on November 6, 2018. And as a state representative, she is focused on improving education, combating gun violence, and ensuring affordable health care and expanding job opportunities to those in her state. Her commitment is sharpened by her personal experiences, including the loss of her father to gun violence and her family's reliance on public services. She is also currently championing and ERPO policy in her own state. Lastly, we'll be joined by my colleague, Lisa Geller, who is a Senior Advisor for Implementation at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions and the co-lead of the Johns Hopkins National ERPO Resource Center. Lisa's work focuses on research, advocacy, implementation, and evidence-based gun violence prevention policies, including extreme risk protection orders and domestic violence protection orders. We'll be cycling through each of these perspectives today to provide their insights on this topic at hand and then kick it off to an open Q&A to provide everyone the opportunity to glean whatever insights they hope from this remarkable panel of folks. But to start us off, I want to talk a little bit about the resource that we're all gathered to discuss today. So we'll be walking through the Extreme Risk Protection Order Model Policy Guide explore some lessons learned from the successful passage of ERPO laws, challenges and reasons for hope in passing ERPO from a perspective of a state legislator championing the law, and learn how to leverage this tool for change. With that being said, Joe, I'm ready to go into the tool itself. So this is a new resource that we at the Center for Gun Violence Solutions have created in an attempt to make policies more accessible to a wide variety of states, whether they have them or not. We convened rigorous scientific research and practice to inform best practice recommendations or promising practices, I should say, to really help guide the creation of effectual laws to help reduce gun deaths and injuries. And these are evidence-based solutions that, we, that have been scoured by research and experts across the nation and culminated into a list of recommendations that can help guide the creation of laws. 
Now, this resource isn't necessarily model legislation in the traditional sense. It's not saying that a law should look exactly in a certain way with exact certain language, but in part because law states are a beautiful tapestry of diversity in their different code sections, and they don't always operate in the same way. There's different nuances to account for. So instead, we combined a more broader list of recommendations to help guide states to ensure that proper elements are included in these laws to help sh make sure that we keep the life-saving uh, effects that we've been seeing in other states across the country while respecting local differences in laws that may be lost if we try to copy language word for word from state to state. This guide, we culminated about 58 recommendations, some of which are essential for the functioning of this policy, others of which are, again, leading to promising practices to try to make it as effectual as possible. Because if a state includes all the recommendations in this guide, it would be the first to have the strongest possible version of this law that we and our experts that we consulted could imagine. And that's really the goal with resources like this. Next slide, Joe. So the process. These recommendations were not merely handed to us. They did not come out of thin air. We really had to go through a rigorous process to create them, to culminate them ourselves. And the first step we did in taking that journey was to review available research and legal opinions. What were scientists saying about the most efficacious aspects of these laws? What were courts saying in terms of what is permissible under state law, under federal law, constitution, to ensure that any recommendation we give doesn't just abide by uh, research recommendations, but also by the guidance of the courts. We also combined advocacy experience and lessons learned through implementation to try to see what practically have we as, and I say we in a very broad sense, including myself, but also expert perspectives that have been on the ground uh, implementing ERPA laws, advocating for ERPA laws since the very beginning of their creation to see what works, frankly, and what doesn't, and what can we strengthen, what can we improve? And this is also an iterative journey. I should note that this guide and the recommendations within it are the best we can envision right now. They will like as new information reveals itself, they'll likely go through other iterations, uh, recommendations could change, expand, whatever best meets the needs of the problems that we're facing. So in addition to applying these research, these legal opinions, these expert insights, we also form groups of recommendation consultants. So some of these were advocates, researchers, implementers, a broad swath of folks who have a very in-depth expert perspective on these laws so that we could, again, really distill the core aspects, the most meaningful components that then we could list out plainly for others to see. And then we refine and reevaluate it we would list potential recommendations, scrutinize them, debate them, and really hone them down until we got the strongest set that we could imagine. But that all being said, some folks may be familiar what policy we're discussing, but others may not. And though the model policy guide approach can and will in the future apply to a broad swath of different gun violence prevention policies, this is the first one that we've chosen to do it on. So this policy known as ERPO, but also as extreme risk protection order laws or red flag laws are civil court orders that temporarily prohibit the possession or purchase of firearms by people deemed by a court to pose a danger to themselves or others. Currently 21 states and the District of Columbia have these laws, but again, due to variance between different states, the key mechanisms and mechanics have some similarities, but also important differences, some of which may work better than others. But one thing we do know is that ERPA laws broadly have significant evidence backing them. And these are a few examples that we highlight in our report. I won't go into all of them in depth, 
but at least emphasizes the point that in terms of addressing suicides, particularly but also promising results in mass shootings, homicides, and other areas where there is concerning connection between gun access and foreseeable gun harm. We see ERPOs as a very promising, protective, preventative tool in addressing the issues we see before us, which tragically has only become more relevant in light of recent events as the story is still developing with the school shooting that occurred in Georgia just a few days ago. Early reports seem to suggest that father and the son implicated in the shooting were known entities to law enforcement at the time with the risk that they posed to others with firearms, but Georgia didn't have an extremist protection order law to equip law enforcement, other respondents with the tools to proactively prevent likely violence from happening, leading us to where we find ourselves today. Thus, we're hoping that states that already have extremist protection order laws, in addition to states that are hoping to pass them, can learn from these promising practices we've compiled to make the strongest, most effective life-saving policy that we can envision. And so this is a brief overview of some of the different uh, categories of recommendations that we've included in the report. So we break it down by looking at the different legal structures that are involved, the petition process for these court orders, how to enforce them, what to do after the orders have been uh, issued, and also how to keep track of data and accountability to measure our progress and see important steps forward. And the guide itself walks through each of these recommendations with a brief explanation of what the recommendations are and why we chose to include them, if relevant, to help give talking points for individuals advancing them, perhaps on the floor of a legislative hearing or even in just backdoor policy discussions. But that all being said, I've talked more than enough, and it's time for us to really learn from the perspectives that have been doing this work hands on. So to tell us more about the hurdles and lessons learned of passing an ERPO law in their home state, I'm going to hand things over to Virginia Delegate Rip Sullivan. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it. I, first thing I want to do is, is congratulate the center uh, for creating this document. It, uh, it, it is remarkably useful. It's remarkably um, uh, complete. Uh, and as best I can tell, um, it is and will be. Well, it's already been an invaluable resource to me. As in, here in Virginia, we we think about uh, fine tuning our, our our red flag law, um, and I know it's going to be a resource to to others who are who are trying to to do this in in other states. So congratulations and, and thank you. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a great achievement. Uh, I did not have <laughs> excuse me. I didn't have the benefit of the, having this document um, when we were having the debate in Virginia. Uh, over our red flag law, uh, but I uh, I had something you know you know frankly probably even a little better, uh, which was Josh Horwitz and Lori Haas uh, with me every step of the way, uh, just remarkably helpful and knowledgeable people. So in Virginia, uh, we call these substantial risk orders. Um, uh, candidly, I'm, I'm, the sort of reason for changing the name of it is sort of lost to time, but my instinct is. Um, that we like substantial better than than extreme. The word extreme simply, you know, uh, uh, attracts attention. Um, but the, the but the practical matter when I talk about it on the floor, when I talked about it then, when I talk about it now on the floor, uh, it's it's a red flag law. It's what everyone calls it. Um, probably most importantly, it's what the media calls it. If you're watching CNN or even Fox, they're red flag laws, and that's uh, that's how uh, you know people remember it when I get asked about it. They don't ask me about risk orders. They ask me about the red flag law. Um, for those of you that are out there, <coughs> excuse me, out there trying, I I urge persistence. Uh, in my case, it took, uh, I, now I've lost count. I think it was, I know it was at least three, it might've been four tries uh, to 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 get a, a, a red flag law through uh, in Virginia. Um, I'm, uh, we were, I think at the time, uh, the 15th state, um, to do this. So I was able to point to other states that had done it, which of course is a crucial um, uh, positive as one's trying to gather votes and uh, and make the point. Uh, you know, I was able to say Virginia's not going to be out there alone doing this for the first time. 
Um, and that's part of an argument that I made constantly over the three or four years in an attempt to try to make this bipartisan. I, and and uh, you know the goal, at least my goal, uh, and I suspect everywhere else um, for the most part, uh, is to is to try to get this to be a bipartisan issue <clears throat> and not just be the Democrats um, forcing it through. Um, I'm I'm uh, uh, disappointed to report that I really had very little success with that uh, here in Virginia. I, I've I looked at all the other states. We got states that are, uh, um, I think, properly described as red states, um, where these things have passed uh, with lo obviously lots of Republican votes. Um, there's something particularly special about uh, about Virginia and and particularly Virginia's gun lobby. Um, I was never able to get a single Republican vote um, uh, for this bill in Virginia. And as a matter of fact, when in final passage, I lost two Democratic votes. Um, uh, uh, Democrats who just you know couldn't bring themselves to to vote for it, worried about worried about the reelection. But despite my experience. I would urge those uh, that are with us here today to keep up that effort because there's nothing about this issue that should be partisan. Um, uh, there are lots of ways to talk about that with with uh, constituents, uh, with colleagues, um, but surely it starts with, uh, you know, these are all our children and children are not uh, Republicans. Uh, uh, children are not Democrats. Um, and in the wake of, of the events in Atlanta yesterday, it just shines yet again another spotlight on the fact that there's nothing nothing partisan about gun safety. Um, so keep at it. Uh, and I think as the ball keeps rolling, uh, I, I remain ever hopeful uh, that we'll be able to keep this uh, a bipartisan issue. Um, by way of uh, sort of my experience and, and, and practice tips, I, I wanted to take a moment, uh, Tim, to highlight <clears throat> excuse me, some of the, uh, what, I, what I thought were the big, with the big hurdles, as I indicated, even with my own party. Um, uh, and and the, the first is sort of the due process issue. Um, this gets uh, um, criticized um, um, by, by its opponents uh, as something which uh, subjects someone to a deprivation of his or her constitutional rights uh, without proper due process. Uh, and the focus uh, for that uh, is the first order, the ex parte initial order, because of course they're not present. And the and the and the the, the, the the policy guide makes the obvious and good point that if you you know give them notice and such, um, uh, that that might that might um, actually precipitate an issue. So uh, it's ex parte for a reason. Um, uh, uh, but that sets off a lot of alarm bells for people. Um, and so we made the decision to make that period of time between an, uh, an initial order and an emergency order being, uh, entered and the final order being considered by the court, uh, to be as short as possible. The, 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 the uh, policy guide I know talks about two to three weeks. My own experience was, um, uh, while for a lot of opponents, any time is too is is too long, at least two weeks. It's just sound, I mean, it is shorter. It sounds shorter, um, uh, and the ability to talk about getting into court quickly and the the loss of the weapon um, uh, being as briefly as possible. Because what I constantly heard uh, as I was out there looking for votes uh, was, well, how is this person supposed to defend him or herself during the time that they've had their weapon taken from them? Um, you're depriving them of that of that ability to defend themselves. So, <laughs> to me, uh, that was a, that probably was the biggest hurdle. Uh, and keeping it at two weeks um, uh, for the first three tries didn't didn't help. But in the but in the final try, uh, I'm 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 convinced that um, putting more in would have, would have made it would have made it even more uh, difficult. Uh, the other very interesting issue, <clears throat> which uh, is still rattling around Virginia. I keep thinking about whether we want to um, fine tune our, our version of it uh, is who can bring these, the section of the legislation that talks about who, who can bring these orders. Um, and in Virginia, uh, uh, what we did was we, uh, and again, this was a tactical decision in an effort to, to, uh, to get votes uh, 
it has to be brought by law enforcement. So a, a Commonwealth attorney in our case, or a district attorney, <clears throat> um, or, or your or your sheriff or police office, police department working with 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 the district attorney, which sounds like a big hurdle, but um, in in reality, it's not because um, uh, uh, if there's a a, a father, a parent, friend, neighbor, a relative, coworker who wants to, <clears throat> who is concerned, um, rather than going to court and finding signing a bunch of papers, uh, their first call is and should be to uh, law enforcement. Uh, which then um, takes the facts in and, and makes decisions about whether to go forward. Um, again, as I said, this was sort of a tactical decision um, because another criticism uh, or horror story, potential horror story that I got as I was trying to push this bill from from its from its opponents was, well, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to run down to 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 court, sign out a warrant. Um, you know, every neighbor who's angry at their neighbor for their dog coming onto their property, um, uh, it, it's going to be used as payback and it's, and, 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 and everything you know, will be out of control. So, uh, we made the decision in Virginia, um, to have, uh, uh, you know, that, that first filter, if you will, um, you go see your police, you go see your sheriff, you get, you, you dealing with the Commonwealth's attorney. None of which has to slow anything down, um, but uh, but gives it an imprimatur of 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 officialdom rather than just having your neighbor file a risk warrant against you, which which people found um, scary. What that does, though, is subsequently put a premium on educating the public uh, about the existence of this thing um, and where they have to go and how they have to use it <coughs> and. We're trying to do that here in Virginia, uh, and I know um, uh, there's going to be some talk about implementation issues later in the in the panel. <clears throat> we unfortunately, uh, um, there's federal money available to uh, for states that have passed uh, uh, red flag laws um, to to do educational efforts with whether it's law enforcement and or the medical community, you know, emergency room physicians, whatever it might be. Um, uh, I've not been able to convince our governor to avail Virginia of that money yet, but that's another effort that um, uh, I'm not going to give up on. Um, but there are jurisdictions, my jurisdiction of Fairfax County being one of them, that has done a terrific job. Uh, I mean, there are there are signs in in, in buses that say if if you, you know, it's, it's sort of a play on if you see something, say something. Um, letting people know uh, how to use this process, and the first call is to law enforcement. Um, I, I will, I will tell you just to bore the group and then I'll, and then I'll be, I'll be quiet, Tim. Um, we, we now have the benefit of having a four years worth of data. Our, our bill went into effect in the summer of 2020. Um, so we've now got four years of data in, um, and over those four years in Virginia, there have been a total of, uh, 478 orders issued around the state, um, uh, that's 308 of the emergency orders and 170 of those remained uh, or were found pursuant to a higher standard, of course. So by a judge, um, uh, final order was entered in 170 of those cases. <clears throat> and one of the things I am, uh, uh, I'm pleased by uh, and talk a lot about when I talk about this in public is that all of these orders are not being entered in, in blue parts of Virginia. Some of them are for sure. Um, but there are places all around Virginia, places that people would regard as as um, red parts of the state, places that uh, in Virginia where, where some jurisdictions have declared themselves as a part of this debate going on about gun safety in Virginia. They have declared themselves officially Second Amendment sanctuary cities. Um, but sheriffs and police off police chiefs in those even some of those jurisdictions. Uh, when someone comes and says, I'm worried about my brother, I'm worried about my sister, uh, the politics goes out the window uh, and the availability of, the, of this of, of this remedy uh, uh, takes center stage and they're being issued. And for those on the call who, who, who might know Virginia, they have been just in the last year, Hanover County, Buena Vista, Appomattox, Prince Edward, Scott County, uh, which is way down in the tip of Virginia, uh, Stanton and Winchester, um, uh, as well as some of the more urban uh, 
jurisdictions. It 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 it, it makes the case, at least to me, and I'm hoping to make it to others, uh, uh, that and I'll land where I began. That this is not partisan. This is not a red blue issue. This is about saving lives, um, and it's working. It's working here in Virginia, and as Tim. Uh, uh, talked about a moment ago it's working it's working uh, all around the country and the data the data is showing it so i'm not sure i've hit my mark precisely tim <laughs> but um i've tried no you did excellent i Sol, and i appreciate those insights and now that we've heard from delegate sullivan about what it's like to pass an extreme risk protection order law we'll turn to a policymaker who's currently championing one herself Representative Amara, can you tell us a bit about your journey in carrying ERPA legislation in Pennsylvania thus far, the challenges you face, and potential paths forward you see? Sure, thank you. Um, and it was very insightful to hear from Virginia and Delegate Sullivan, because Virginia is one of the states that I point to as a state that has passed it, because in Pennsylvania, um, there's a lot of similarities to Virginia. Uh, so my name is Jennifer O'Mara. I'm a state representative in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been working on the ERPO bill since I got elected in 2019. Prior to 2023, though, I was uh, one of the co-prime sponsors because ERPO, since it's been introduced since 2016 or so, has typically been a bipartisan piece of legislation that has been worked on in Pennsylvania, which is a great positive sign. Um, at least a little by a little bipartisan. Um, but in 2023, the member who had been working on it retired, so it became my bill. But we had sort of walked hand in hand because former Representative Todd Stevens was a federal prosecutor and my father died by gun suicide. And we decided to take this joint approach of policy and personal, hoping that we could, if we couldn't win over someone's brain, we could win over their heart. Um, unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in those first four years because the leader at the time of the House and the Senate refused to even have a hearing on the bill. We couldn't even get it scheduled for a committee vote. Um, where we have landed since then is uh, we're now a split government and it should not be a partisan issue and I don't wanna make it one. However, it's just relevant to the facts and what's happening in Pennsylvania. Uh, one party runs the House, one party runs the Senate. So in 2023, we were able to finally get some progress on an agreement to at least run the bill out of committee and put it on the floor and see what happened. Um, I can truthfully say, I don't think everyone whipped the vote as much as I did. Um, and I tried to speak to as many members as possible because I knew that I had bipartisan opposition, as you mentioned um, in Virginia, but also um, bipartisan support. So what we ended up doing, we got the bill out of committee. Our Arbor bill is, as written a little different than it is in Virginia. Um, it can be brought forward by a family member as still as written by a family member or law enforcement. Family member is kind of defined as someone who lives in the house because it could also be a loved one that's, you know, maybe not married, but um and you had to be brought in front of a judge which in within 72 hours and then the order could be put in place by the judge for anywhere from three months to one year with the requirement to come back in front of the judge. Um, we That was really important to the former representative who took a big stand in writing this because of the due process relationship, you know, how important it is to maintain due process. The opposition this session ended up, um, well, but before we got it out of the house though, we ended up making an amendment on the floor. And I did that in order to get more votes. I knew I needed at least two votes on the other side of the aisle. I wanted to have three, you know, you like to have a cushion. And one of those members made me, asked me to agree to an amendment. And that amendment, which we did agree to, um, would create a felony for someone who brings an ERPO against someone maliciously. And that was a really important piece for that member because we have seen, at least in our state, uh, abuse of other laws that have been passed, especially when the, the, the example he used was the PFA 
uh, protection from abuse and how commonly they're now used in divorces. And he was very worried about fathers and their their children. And, and I understood. So we agreed, despite the fact that it made some progressive members very angry because we were creating a new law. But I felt like it was an important strategical move. So I said, yes, we passed the amendment. Ironically, that member ended up voting no on final passage. But I did get enough votes to for it to pass 102 to 101. 102 is our threshold in Pennsylvania. So we got it out of the House in May 8th of 2023. And a week later, the Senate chair or the Senate president issued a statement that they would not run any gun related bills in the Senate for the remainder of the session, which the session ends at the end of this year. So we have sort of been up against that wall. Um, we have had activists, we have had legislators, we have had all sorts of outreach to the Senate to try to change their mind, but we're not getting anywhere. Um, I'm hopeful that I'm, I've been trying to, again, take that personal approach. I'm trying to meet, reach out to senators and talk to them and try and get them to understand that what we're trying to do is not, in fact, what they what some of these talking points are. And unfortunately, I agree so much with Delegate Sullivan about the use of language. I hate that we refer to them as red flag laws, but that's what they are. I try all the time to say ERPOs instead, but he, you're right. Like my constituents don't ask me about ERPOs, they ask me about red flag laws. Um, but we're trying to remind them that we are not trying to take anyone's Second Amendment away. In fact, the alternative at this point, if you truly believe your family member is a threat to themselves, is a 302, and that results in permanent loss of gun rights, which somehow it became an argument this year that we should just change the 302 law instead of the ERPO. Um, I'm not going down that path. I'm pretty committed. But one thing we are considering in Pennsylvania to try and gain more bipartisan support is actually the approach that they take they have taken in Virginia. And that is having it be re reduced down to law enforcement being the only ones that are able to bring forth the order. Um, the reason that is just it seems to be more appealing. Interestingly enough, law enforcement is trying to get on board with our bill because we have there's actually a really horrific incident in 2023 where state troopers were murdered by someone who kind of like tracked them and hunted them down and um definitely was a known threat to his community to even to the state troopers and so we now have their family members that are joining us in our fight. And I've been working directly with the state troopers because they would basically where Pennsylvania state troopers, the union has come down is they can't support the bill as written because of the way their collective bargaining is they would lose their right to be a trooper if someone brought one against them permanently. And we, you know, we're trying to make an argument that that shouldn't happen. That they are too. So it, we're sort of working through that because we believe if we can get law enforcement's buy-in, and if we make that change, we'll get more bipartisan support. Just because of the views that everyone has for law enforcement, which I think is a good approach. And thanks to Johns Hopkins, we now have a. A document that we can show that shows what other states have done. I think we're up to 25 or 26 other states now that have passed this. We can make comparisons. We can. I love pointing to Virginia and Florida um, for what they have done. Florida also is law enforcement only, but Florida also has orders that have been brought across the whole state. So like you mentioned in Virginia, not in just red or, or blue counties, but red counties too. And we actually have a sheriff from Florida willing to come testify in Pennsylvania and make the case, which uh, we think will be really helpful. So um, that is sort of where we are right now. There's definitely compelling public support for this and the data and the um, polling continues to show that, which I think also is steadily gonna help change some minds. We did pass a firearm related bill in 2018 in Pennsylvania before I got elected that um, isn't like it's sort of tied to an ERPO. It allows a guns to be removed if a PFA is brought forward in a, in um, certain cases. Um, so there's there's hope and reason for me to think that we're going to have this pass in the next couple of years. And uh, we are not going to give up. And it's um, it has been promising to me the conversations that I have had since because I get up and I share a very personal story on the floor and try to make this 
as much of a gut punch as I can. And so it has led to some of my colleagues that I've never talked to before coming to talk to me because they know someone who died this way. And while they may not have been convinced on this vote, they, you know, they'd love to talk to me about ways we can get there. Um, so I thank you all in a public policy world for helping us create the public health argument, because that is, I think, going to be an important factor in changing minds. And sadly, I'd be remiss if I didn't say as um, large scale shootings and, and incidents and, and school shootings continue to happen. And we continue to see that if we had only passed this legislation, we could have saved these children's lives. Um, I think that's going to eventually get to a breaking point where legislators can't ignore their community anymore. I, I, I hope that it, I wish it would have happened when I was in high school and they started happening, but unfortunately we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. So thank you all. And I'm looking forward to answering questions. No, thank you for those points, Representative Omar, especially highlighting the sense of wishing that we had resources in hindsight, but realizing that once they're made available to us, especially as we've seen in Virginia, even if there may be apprehension or lack of familiarity, like ultimately when it comes to saving lives and helping people will use them. So now that we've heard from two policy leaders championing this issue, we're going to turn to my colleague who has worked to help advocate, implement, and research extremist protection order laws, Lisa Geller. So Lisa, why don't you tell us a bit about how advocates can leverage tools such as the one we're here to discuss today to make meaningful change and what other lessons can listeners take away from your work on these laws? Well, thanks, Tim, for inviting me to speak. And thanks to Delegate Sullivan and, and Representative O'Mara for sharing your um, successes and what will I know be a success in Pennsylvania. I want to um, just go back to something that Delegate Sullivan said, because I have been working on ERPO legislation and implementation for a decade. So back to when we really only had Connecticut pass um, and Indiana in 1999 and 2005, and then California in 2014. So uh, when I first started, we had very few states to point to, and now we do have 21 states and the District of Columbia with this legislation, but it's not always an easy road to get there. And as Delegate Sullivan said, in Virginia, this bill took many sessions to, to ultimately pass. And I believe um, Governor Northam signed it in 2020, um, but I know that bill had been introduced in 2015, 16, 17, 18. So my advice um, for those who this advice is relevant is, do not give up because it's not something that we can expect to necessarily introduce and pass in one session, although that also has happened. And the context in which that has happened is usually in the aftermath of a high profile shooting, a mass shooting, a school shooting. Florida, for example, passed their legislation after the Parkland shooting in 2018. They did so relatively quickly and with bipartisan support, but I hate to see this being passed as a response to a mass shooting, because as a public health researcher, we should be proactive. We should be passing these in order to prevent shootings. We should not pass these as a reaction, but but instead to prevent future shootings. Um, but we also know, Tim mentioned, Georgia does not have an ERPO law. They um, experienced a school shooting a couple days ago where the res potential respondent, if they had had a shooting, would have been a minor. And I know we had a question in the chat about that. We'll get to um, if minors can be respondents to ERPOs. But we also know that shootings do still happen in states that have extremist protection orders. The Buffalo shooting was a high profile shooting in New York that happened just a couple of years ago. And they had a extremist protection order law at the time. And so my focus and, and passion is also on implementing these types of laws, because we know that passing the legislation is a big step and a big hurdle, but it's not the only step and it's certainly not the final step. So I use this guide that I, I helped him to write as a policy roadmap, but also as an implementation roadmap. So if you are listening and you live in a state without an extremist protection order law, this guide is designed to make it easy for your lawmakers to introduce legislation 
But if you live in a state where you do have or work in a state where you do have an extremist protection order law, you can use this as a means to updating your legislation, which Delegate Sullivan talked about, and, and maybe there will be some fixes in Virginia. But you can also use this as an implementation roadmap. We talk a lot about legislative fixes, but not everything has to be done through legislation. A lot of what we see in the extremist protection order space is actually done through practice. And that actually relates to the minors point where statutes are largely silent on the role of minors in ERPOs. Uh, when we look at what's being done in practice, we do see that happening. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the, to the Q&A. But you can use this, this roadmap in a variety of circumstances to pass legislation, to update legislation, but also to, to amend legislation. And I also want to talk about the ex parte component of this. And Tim will talk about um, court cases that have upheld extremist protection orders around the country. But ERPO, um, ex parte proceedings are not unique to extremist protection orders. I have been around Tim and other lawyers long enough to turn into a fake lawyer and say that it depends and all that legal jargon that Tim has <laughs> advised me of over, over the last several years of working together. But um, when it comes to this ex parte piece that a lot of people highlight um, as, as a barrier to passing this legislation, I would urge lawmakers and advocates to point to ex parte proceedings in domestic violence protection order cases or in a wide variety of other circumstances in which an individual can be temporarily deprived certain rights to protect public safety. My colleague Spencer Cantrell always says people can have their children removed ex parte before they are afforded a right to a hearing. So this is not unique to extremist protection orders. And I really encourage that um, to be a part of the discussion because it is often talked about in the context of ERPOs, but we have ex parte proceedings in domestic violence protection orders. Extremist protection orders were built off of domestic violence protection orders. Every single state has a domestic violence protection order. Um, not all states involve firearm removal in those statutes, but a lot of them do. Uh, and so if you are, again, working, living in a state that doesn't have an ERPO law, and you wanna see how this is being handled in other civil protection orders, do look towards your domestic violence protection order to see how it's done. And also with the framework that you're building, you can look to a uh, domestic violence protection order to see um, what courts are handling these types of, of um, cases. We do see these are civil orders, and I think that is that is important to note, though there can be criminal penalties if you violate them. And as Rep. O'Mara said, there can be uh, perjury charges um, or felony charges if you maliciously file, though I will point to the research showing this not being a real issue. When we look at states that have ERPO legislation, there is hardly any misuse, and the misuse that we do see is typically not the result of malicious intent, but rather someone not knowing if they can file, what court or what jurisdiction to file in, because it can be confusing. Do you file in the jurisdiction that you live in or the respondent lives in? So we don't really see a lot of um, malicious intent when we're talking about ERPOs. And if we do, it's usually um, the result of some misunderstanding about how the law works. But regardless, I do think it's important that there be those, those perjury charges for false filing, um, because we certainly don't want this being used in such a way. So in short, I um, am a, a strong believer in the role of prevention as a public health researcher. So I think that we should not sit around and wait for a mass shooting or a school shooting or all the other shootings that don't make the news, which by the way is most of them. Uh, mass shootings account for less than 1% of gun violence in this country. Gun suicides make up 50%, more than 50%. And we also see ERPOs being used largely in response to, to suicides. In fact, um, just a couple of weeks ago, our, our colleague at Duke, Jeff Swanson, and other colleagues released a study showing that for every 17 ERPOs issued, one suicide was prevented. So we do now have strong data showing the role that ERPOs can play in suicide prevention. So I am looking forward to the Q&A, and we have 17 minutes. So please do put your questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Lisa, and definitely appreciate your insights in this discussion, especially on focusing that passing a law is certainly not the last step in this journey. 
of preventing gun violence, especially through policy, but that implementation implementation is importantly tied to it. And also guidance for people in their states to really look towards pre-existing frameworks in their legislative environments, like which courts are handling cases analogous to extremist protection orders? How are these orders being administered? And those factors can blend in very well to creating or more smoothly implementing extremist protection order laws in their own states. But that all being said, we are opening up to the Q&A portion, and y'all are wildly fortunate to have all of these uh, great policy professionals and brilliant minds and impassioned souls here to talk with you about this issue. So please put questions you have in the chat. We already have a few queued up, but it's not too late, and we'd love to hear your thoughts and address your questions and concerns as they come to us. So that being said, I'm going to scroll down to the first one. So someone asks us that that I understand Urkel laws are at the state level. When a minor is a person in crisis who has access to a firearm, but the owner of that firearm is a parent, can an ERPO be served on the minor even though they are not the owner of the firearm? And Lisa, I think you're doing some work on this exact question. Yes, I can I can answer that. And then I saw Delegate Sullivan go off off mute. So I would love, love to hear his perspective. But there are a few uh, states that address this in statute. So in, in Washington state, they amended their law to make it explicit that minors can be respondents to ERPOs. Michigan, which passed their law last year, went into effect this year, one of the newest states along with Minnesota to pass an ERPO law also makes it explicit in the statute that minors can be respondents. But we also see in practice that where state statute might be absent on this guidance, in practice, judges are, in some cases, granting ERPOs against minors. And what that means, and, and it can be confusing because there is an overlap with safe storage, is that depending on the jurisdiction, the minor may not be able to live in a home with a firearm. So if they live in a home where there is a, a gun owner, a legal gun owner in the house, they may be required to store their firearms outside the home during that time period. They may be further required to keep those firearms uh, unloaded and locked and stored in the home safely, ensuring that a minor doesn't have access. They may also be required to sign um, an affidavit that they know that the minor child in their home is a respondent and they will face charges if they allow that minor to have access. So it varies in practice what it looks like, but the, the key point is, some states might be silent on this in statute, but be doing this in practice. Yeah, uh, may I, Tim? Absolutely, Delegate Sullivan. Yeah, uh, and 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 thank you, Lisa. I think you're 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 exactly right. Um, and th this comes back to the issue that Lisa and I have, have have talked about, and that's that's the due process problem that um, uh, that comes up. I, and I view the minor, this minor issue as the trickiest part of of an ERPO piece of legislation. Uh, the Virginia statute is silent on it. Um, we do have some, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, examples uh, of minors being having orders entered against them. The tricky part, the legal part, is. Minors, you know, of course, aren't supposed to be owning fi own firearms. Um, uh, there's some issue on that with rifles in Virginia, but certainly, certainly handguns. <clears throat> a minor can't own a handgun. Um, so you're you're affecting someone else's. That would probably be a parent. Uh, someone else's constitutional right, um, and that gets really, really tricky. Um, one of the things I worry about, we, we did have a bill introduced this year in Virginia to try to clarify that, to talk about access to firearms um, within a house. Um, it, it actually passed. The, the governor vetoed it. Um, but I always worry that when you try to fix a bill and if it fails, then opponents will take that as showing that the bill doesn't do. Uh, you know, that's evidence, if you will, that the bill doesn't allow uh, action when there's a minor in the house, so so that so that 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 can be that can be fraught with with peril. Um, but Lisa's pointed out the exact the exact issue and some combination of uh, there's certainly nothing in in the Virginia 
code that says a minor cannot be the subject of such a thing. Um, uh, and these things can be brought in juvenile court. Um, uh, and it is very specific as to that. The question becomes what happens to some to a gun when someone else in the home owns the gun? Statute does have um, uh, language about if, if people are um, uh, uh, living with someone uh, uh, about what can happen in that situation. But it, it, it's one of those issues, and, and, and uh, Jennifer, you're going to be facing this. I don't know whether, whether you're going to try to do it with your original bill or, or subsequently. Um, but certainly, you know, as school shootings uh, continue to, to happen, uh, with now 14 year olds. Um, uh, it, it's an issue that I'd, I'd like some clarity on it. And, and I'm, I'm committed in Virginia to try to, to get some clarity on that. And I think Lisa's pointed out some really good ways, uh, that everyone on this call can look at, uh, and thank consider. you very much. Thank you very much, Delegate Sullivan. And that's right. Part of why this guide exists <laughs> is that this is a complicated policy. There's a lot of moving parts. It implicates several aspects of the legal system, several aspects of civil rights and liberties, but all which all direct towards the path that it needs to be very carefully tailored and created to achieve the specific purpose while not wading away from that. And which leads us into a different question, asking if red flag laws have been found to violate due process or any similar ex parte process. And broadly speaking, as an attorney following these cases, no. I mean, there was this New York Supreme Court case that had flagged an issue that it perceived with New York's ERPA law on regards to due process, but that case didn't stick and ended up being overturned. And largely, the few courts that have evaluated this issue of due process have upheld the laws in large part because of what Lisa has already mentioned. Ex parte processes are implemented all over the legal system for critical reason. There are specific instances where the risk is so high that it mitigates the temporary deprivation of some other rights. And the child welfare context, which is my background that Lisa mentioned, is the starkest example of this, where if there's a credible risk to children in the moment, but there isn't time to do an extensive uh, fact-finding court hearing, we need to at least ensure during a brief window of time while folks go and gather this evidence to return back to court that children are safe and harm is mitigated. And that is the constant balancing of freedom of security that law is built around. But at least as far as we know now, extreme risk protection orders and the ex parte components are constitutional and do not pose credible due process issues. Yeah, I, let me just quickly add, Lisa, uh, Lisa and, and Tim are exactly right. The best way to have a conversation about this issue is to point to other existing situations. Um, it, it doesn't win every argument. It doesn't win every vote, but it does uh, It does make sense to people. They understand those situations, um, and, 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 it, and it helps take down the temperature a little bit on this, uh, oh, gee, you're, you're taking my gun without any due process problem. No, and that's a great point, Delegate Sullivan, and a good segue to Representative Amara, as someone who's currently trying to advance this policy in her legislator, legislative body. Is there anything particular about ERPO laws that you found garner bipartisan support, or are there any parts of the ERPO that you emphasize when trying to reach across the aisle to bring people to your cause? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, generally the amount of other states that have passed it, especially red, red states, tend to give a positive, like, garners more support. Um, when I bring up the 302 and the process that that creates, I mean, you can technically get your right to own a gun back, but it's a really lengthy legal process and it doesn't, you're not always successful. So people do tend to recognize that they want an alternative. I also have taken um, you know, I try to use data as much as I can. So we, we can cite the number of um, orders that have been filed versus implemented in other states. So, and you can, you know, I, I wrote down the one about um, for every 17 issue, one life is saved. I've been looking for something like that. Um, 
Um, but we also, oh my gosh, my thought just went right out of my head. I hate when that happens to me. It happens way too. I have a two year old at home, so it like happens way too frequently. Um, generally like getting law enforcement support is going, is something we is, oh, oh, I remember now rural Pennsylvania. So suicide rates are actually highest in our state in rural Pennsylvania among middle-aged white men. And I try and use that statistic because it, it's not, you know, it, yes, suicide, we see a lot of shootings in the cities of our state and we see more crime, uh, you know, in the city of our state. But where we are seeing suicides is where my colleagues who represent don't want to admit that there's a gun violence problem. So we really have tried to take that language around ERPO being suicide prevention and how and why that's going to help. Oh, and the fact that mental health among young people is so bad and suicide rates among young people keep rising. That is a, a point that parents um, who serve in the legislature really seem to be touched by. Unfortunately, it's a strong argument, which is, you know, really devastating and sad. And something pretty specific to Virginia, veterans, alarming yeah. rates of suicide. Yes. Um, and Virginia has an enormous veteran population. Uh, and that, that's a, that is effective. Um, you know, it, it's a really interesting dichotomy because um, ERPO's uh, gun violence, as Lisa was saying, you know, suicide, is most, most, most gun violence is suicide. Um, uh, but when, when, when red flag laws get talked about, it's in the wake of things like Georgia, yeah. Um, and it, 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 you do have to remind people as you're as you're advocating for these uh, that this is as much, if not more, about suicide and preventing suicides uh, as it is. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't add on to that point about veterans too, because I'm married to a combat veteran, and um, he and other veterans have used their advocate, like have become advocates and. Uh, one of our organizations in Pennsylvania actually hired a combat veteran, former, or I think was a registered Republican, maybe an independent, but definitely had a different view to be their lead lobbyist on the ERPO bill this last session, which was a really interesting move, but it proved to be an impactful one. No, and I love these points that you all are making about because gun violence is so diverse in the ways it materializes in our lives and the people that it impacts, you find the stories, you find the angles that resonate most to really show people that this is that this impacts all of us in different ways. That being said, there's a really quick little technical question I can address about the guide, which is asking, does this guide include examples of ex effective <clears throat> forms for ERPO petitions, affidavits, firearm surrenders, et cetera? This guide does not include specific forms in large part because there's so much variance across the country and different types of legal documentation, different legal processes of how forms are issued that it wouldn't be possible to, to adequately sum it all up in one form for the nation. But if you're looking for specific examples of states, you can certainly reach out to our team and we'd be happy to look at what your state currently has, as well as apply examples of some other states that seem particularly uh, helpful. Also, we do have a promising practices guide that Lisa has helped co-author that focuses on ERPO implementation specifically that provides some guidance on these issues. And so whereas this ERPO model policy guide really focuses on the front end of making the policy, uh, Lisa's implementation guide really helps work out some of those mechanical everyday on the ground questions of how do we get this to work? Hey, Tim, can, I, can I take one 30 yeah. seconds? Go for it. Yeah. I saw one question about other arguments against ERPO and it reminded me of something I wanted to say. Um, one of the big arguments is, well, this is a mental health issue. Um, and uh, people who kill people, people who kill themselves are suffering from mental illness. We've got to hope we get, you know, it's a mental illness issue. We have to be very careful as we, as as we uh, advocate for these bills, that we not conflate mental illness with um, gun violence. Uh, not every person, in fact, almost every person with a mental illness is not violent. And we have to be very careful to not suggest that people with mental illness are violent and only people with mental illness uh, are capable of either committing suicide or committing a violent act based on some crisis that's going on. <clears throat> so, um, uh, that is, I think that was 
uh, former President Trump's first reaction, right? This is a madman. And, and the implication is that the, therefore there's nothing we can do. About it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know I've been uh, coughing. No. I've meant, meant to mute, but uh, no, uh, I, I think that's important it. for people to know. No, I appreciate that, Delegate Sullivan. And that's a critical point as well. If you look into our model policy guide, we'll list some recommended considerations for when issuing extremist protection orders. And mental health on its own is not a credible reason to issue an order. You need to look for, it's not a risk factor for violence in the same way that past histories of violence and some other factors are. But with that being said, we could definitely talk about this for much longer. And we have a long line of questions that unfortunately we won't be able to get to today. So I wanted to take the remaining minute to thank everyone for tuning into this webinar, to thank Delegate Sullivan, Representative Omara, Lisa Geller for coming on to this webinar this morning to help share their insights and information about this tool, about this law, and how we can make it a reality across the nation. And because we've seen that it works, we have data that shows that it works. And so we have this tool, it exists, but it's up to us to make it and it's up to us to use it. So thank you everyone for tuning in today.